for our short lives and inspire us in some small way each day to live with grace and courage, compassion and generosity by listening to the gentle voice that you have placed within us. Amen. Amen. Next stand to the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need a motion for adoption of the agenda. Approval. Second. I have a, a motion by Mrs. Ryan, a second by Mr. Dodd to adopt the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Citizens' comments. Citizens' comments are, are reserved for comments requesting on the agenda items. Any citizens' comments regarding the agenda items? Moving on. Bishop, not here. Do we want to move up this time? Certain, um, we were already missed it at 10 a.m. Yeah, if we can do it now, that's we're, we're on you right now. Yeah, all right, thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, Mr. Bishop sends his regrets for not being here this morning. He's out of state on a personal matter. Um, he is very excited about the proposition of bringing weather stem to the district. He sees this as a direct benefit to our student athletes, our coaches, and our administrators. Uh, as you may already know, we have Weather STEM uh, Station at Marine Science Station for a few years, and it serves there as an instructional tool. You can look on the screens, and you can see uh, the current reading and the webcam there. Uh, while there is an educational component available with Weather STEM, the application of Weather STEM in the context of today's discussion and presentation will focus on the benefits of this equipment to the athletics and the extracurricular uh, arena. Back in early fall, Mr. Bishop contacted uh, Roger Mayo, County Athletic Director for Escambia County, inquired about weather stem and how they're using it, this equipment in Escambia County. Um, after this conversation and recognizing the many benefits for our student athletes, coaches, and administrators, Mr. Bishop contacted Mr. Mansuri, who's here today, and arranged a meeting with Mr. Mansuri from weather stem, Mr. Bishop, and our facilities department. Shortly afterwards, Mr. Bishop invited Mr. Mansuri to attend this county athletic director's meeting and present weather stem to our athletic directors and gather feedback from those directors. It was unanimous. Each of our athletic directors agreed this equipment would be valuable asset management of our student athletes and our extracurricular events that we have at our schools. Months after Mr. Bishop began his due diligence re regarding weather stem, there's been legislation proposed this current <coughs> session that would mandate environmental monitoring and providing guidelines to be followed in accordance with environmental conditions. This is House Bill 7011. Uh, today's presentation is another example of Mr. Bishop and all of our Citrus County School Board uh, employees remaining on the forefront of our students' needs and their safety uh, well in advance of being mandated to do so by our legislature. Uh, once again, Mr. Bishop is, uh, regrets that he's not here, but I think you probably all know he's probably watching as we speak right now because that's how important uh, this topic is to him. Um, with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Mansuri from Weatherstead to come on up and uh, give his presentation. If you all have any questions, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me thank you for your patience. My pleasure. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Citrus County is a place that I've had a chance to spend a lot of time. Uh, my uh, first wife went to, is a graduate of Citrus County High School and uh, grew up here in Inverness, so I spent many times here, and I'm very blessed to be here. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about our Weather STEM program. We're very uh, fortunate to have had a chance to meet Mr. Bishop and form a friendship with him. And uh, as um, was mentioned, we have had the privilege of working with uh, Mr. Ernie Olson and his team over at the uh, Marine Science Station in Crystal River for many years now, using our program in an academic context. Uh, the program started as a weather and environmental literacy tool. And we had built into the program some features that we, we were unaware that we were building features that would eventually have a health and safety ramification. Uh, for instance, um, every time we set up one of these systems that we call a weather stem unit, we actually go to the site and set up a weather station. So this is actually a picture of the weather station over at the Marine Science Station. Um, in addition to that, weather is a very visual phenomenon. So each of these systems has its own, at least one, weather camera. So the system at the Marine Science Station lets you enjoy these beautiful views. This is looking inland toward what I believe is the Salt River, correct? Um, and then this is looking out uh, toward the Gulf, okay, and those very panoramic views. 
Um, but in addition to that, you'll notice if you look at the interface here, you'll notice a lot of other interesting features and functionality. For instance, I can tell you right now how far away is the closest lightning activity to that particular location. And it will give me some very specific information. For instance, there's a little white flag here. That is a heat flag. So as that color moves toward black, that indicates that the severity of heat, which would affect outdoor uh, workers or student athletes, is more and more severe. Okay. So um, uh, it was mentioned that we have a uh, partnership with uh, Scambia County. So I'll go up to, now the way WeatherStem works, we have at least one of these systems in all 67 counties in Florida. And just as a little bit of background, in Citrus County at the Marine Science Station. So I live in Leon County. I'm from Tallahassee. I drove down this morning. Um, and prior to starting WeatherStem, um, I actually, have, you're familiar with the Florida Virtual School. If you have taken a course from the Florida Virtual School in the last 17 years, you, the platform that you use to take your assessments, to receive your curriculum, to communicate with your peers, is a platform that I authored. So I authored the software and designed the hardware that the Florida Virtual School has operated on since 2003. Uh, so I'm very proud that that has served counties across the state, including Citrus County. Now, I sold that technology to the state of Florida in 2016 so that I could focus my full energy on this WeatherStem program that I'm here talking to you about. And in 2015, to kick the project off, we donated a WeatherStem system to a public school in all 67 Florida counties. And Mr. Olson and his team at the Marine Science Station were the uh, recipient of that donation for Citrus County Schools. So that's how we came to work with you. Um, so now, as the program has evolved to take more health and safety related functionality, we're working at the district level with a number of counties, including Escambia, that I'll demonstrate to you. So in Escambia County, there are seven public high schools. So for instance, I'm going to go to Escambia High School, which is right there in downtown Pensacola. And so each of these systems has its own website. So this is the WeatherStem website uh, for Escambia High School. So anyone in the world can go to this website and see what the real-time conditions are right now. Um, in addition to that, there's this important link called Lightning and Heat Guidance. And when I click on that, it is going to give me some guidance, okay, both for lightning and heat, which are pretty much going to be the most important safety-related things we're concerned with when we talk about student-athletes. Okay. So this is going to show me every minute over the last half hour how far away has the closest lightning activity been. Now right now we're pretty fortunate that uh, at that particular location we don't have, as you can see, the closest lightning is a couple hundred miles away. But if it was closer it would give us this color coding, which is sort of guidance as far as what should we do in this particular situation. Uh, and there are protocols, and these, these protocols were actually developed in partnership with an entity in Gulf Breeze, Florida called the Andrews Institute. They are a think tank for sports medicine, for preventative health and safety. So a lot of their guidance based on a tremendous amount of research has found its way into our program and is available at the fingertips of your coaches, your athletic trainers, your staff that will be available on their phones, um, on their devices, on their tablets to help them make real-time decisions related to uh, student safety on the whether there's a practice or competition or, or combination thereof. Okay. Also, um, it was uh, mentioned before um, uh, House Bill 7011. That is pending legislation and, and Mr. Bishop uh, was, was very uh, instrumental in helping put that legislation on our radar when he reached out to us last fall. Um, and this is, it has full support, and if it passes, which it's expected to do, um, there will be very specific requirements that all scholastic athletic programs have as far as keeping their student athletes safe. Okay? Um, for instance, one of the fiduciary requirements is you're going to have to have ice tanks um, or ice tubs on the actual playing fields. Um, there's also some language regarding uh, you know, cardiac uh, resuscitation equipment. Uh, one of the provisions also is related to environmental monitoring, and one of the metrics that it refers to is a quantity called WBGT, which stands for wet bulb globe temperature, uh, which is a mouthful. Now, traditionally, the metric that has been used to assess the risk of excessive heat on an athlete is heat index, which is a combination of temperature and humidity. <coughs> However, what if it is a dry day, relatively cool, but there's no wind and the sun is directly overhead. You can still develop some hyperthermia, some excessive heat, some heat exhaustion related symptoms. So wet bulb globe temperature is a more complete metric that not only takes into consideration temperature and humidity, 
but sunlight and systems, the, the equipment, the infrastructure that we bring to these sites has all of the input measurements to compute wet bulb globe temperature. Uh, and it's basically, it's based on a flag-based system. There are um, white, yellow, orange, and red and black flags. And as you can see, um, it, it actually breaks down the guidance for, um, you know, in a, in a context for athletes. So for instance, it might be cool enough where you can practice, but too hot for you to have full pads on. Okay, so um, in this program, it will give us um, minute by minute guidance of what the conditions had been during the last hour. And what we actually did in Escambia County, and what we would be doing uh, in partnership with your athletics program, is uh, conditions can vary over a short distance pretty rapidly. So at, at, at all of these high schools in Escambia County, we have a sensor actually down on the field. Okay, so we actually have a field level sensor. Real quick, um, any Gators fans? Okay, I never know if uh, if, if I'm closer to Tallahassee, uh, I have to use uh, Florida State as an example. But this same this same system that we would be setting up at your schools here is actually at the swamp. Um, if you go to a UF game and you look way on top of the stadium, you'll see our weather stem system there. And we actually have sensors down on the field level. Now the opening game last season. Um, the temperature on top of the stadium, where the weather stem system is, was 96 degrees, which was a record high for Gainesville that day. Down on the field, at the field level, where we also have a sensor, it was 116 degrees. Okay? And uh, that information is able to be used by the trainers, by the, uh, by the preparation staff, to make sure that there's more electrolytes, make sure there's more ventilation, to keep not only the players, but the field personnel safe as well. So again, the same technology that is deployed at a lot of the major universities in the Atlantic Coast Conference and the Southeast Conference would be deployed here at uh, Citrus County High Schools um, facil athletic facilities across the county. Um, I will, uh, you know, I, I could go on talking to you for a long time. I know I have a brief amount of time to sort of brief you about what this program is about. Um, I wanted to say that we have a uh, very highly skilled installation staff, so we would be coming in and doing the installation ourselves. Um, our installer has coordinated over 400 of these installations, and we always, uh, typically as we go further south into Florida, uh, for instance, Monroe County, uh, Collier County, we have to provide engineering drawings that warrant that these things aren't going to blow off of a building the next time a hurricane comes through. So we use extremely sound construction methodologies and practices as well. And there is uh, a very strong academic component to this program. Uh, the name STEM and Weather STEM is not gratuitous. There are literally, if you click on this link called Scholar, you'll actually see literally tons, and by tons I mean hundreds of lessons that cover weather topics from A to Z that are aligned. They're, they're currently aligned to Florida's Next Generation Sunshine Standards, but we, our curriculum writer is, as we speak, looking to see how we can be plant a flag, plant a flag in the ground with um, Commissioner Corcoran's new best um, educational standards. Um, so again, that's sort of a high level of what this program is about. Uh, we would be very honored to put it to work in service to Citrus County Schools and their athletic interests, uh, students, coaches, etc. Uh, I'm eager to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Mr. Dodge, yes. so should, thank you. Wait, should we tell him that we were sitting there when Masuo presented this bill and we were <laughs> listening to every word yes. he said? Yes. Just a caveat. Yes. Education uh, so, uh, subcommittee meeting in Tallahassee for we were there for the same day. So, um, the notification system, yes. I in, uh, so these temperature readings and the wet bulb globe thermometer reading, uh, the heat index, all those, um, when you give this white flag, red flag, black flag warnings, they'll be able to be <coughs> sent via text to yes. the coaches, correct? Yes, uh, the way it'll work is, and part of our program, a very important and I consider indispensable part of our program is training. So we come in and actually help the, uh, Mr. Bishop and his team and teams uh, coordinate the implementation of this program onto staff phones uh, and to uh, other devices. So when you log into the program, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll try to do this very quickly just so that I don't, uh, you know, get taken down too many side paths. But when I log in as an administrator, for instance, I can go here to, for instance, something called the Practical Lightning Assistant. 
And from there, I can create, I'll just call this tests, and I will make it a point. So what I can do is on this map, I can create shapes, polygons, circles, and then what I'm doing is I'm actually able to attach notifications that will go out when lightning comes within the perimeter of one of these shapes. And then I can govern what, where those devices, where those notifications should go. So for instance, um, you know, what is a typical scenario is someone like Mr. Bishop might import an Excel document that maybe has all the athletic staff in the district. And that Excel document might have their phone numbers. And then we would be able to import that into WeatherStem and then set the conditions under which those notifications get dispatched. So high heat, high wet bulb globe temperature, um, you know, lightning conditions. There are also a number of our districts that we work with. The facilities folks set up alerts for things like high winds. And there's also a predicted model as well. So you can have alerts sent not only when the conditions get to a certain point, but when they're expected to get to a certain point. So for instance, you know, what good is a notification that you're going to have high winds once they've already arrived? Because by then you might be experiencing damage. So we can have notifications go out that might alert like a facilities person. Uh, the winds are expected to exceed 40 miles an hour in the next 36 hours. So they can have some more preventative steps that can be taken. But yeah, the notification part of our program is really the, the real meat and potatoes of what you're procuring. Yes, and when we look at protecting student athletes um, uh, from you know, heat related illness, I mean, this is gonna be critical. So I think it's a great program. I'm, I know it's gonna, uh, you know, I, I know the cost, of, that's there's a cost associated with it, but it is by far um, what we need to do to protect our student athletes and give information to coaches so that they can make their decisions. And, um, you know, yeah, I'm on the board of directors for FHSAA, so okay. we've had a lot of discussions. Uh, Zach Polsenberg's mom was there, the young man who died mm -hmm. in Riverdale High School, and you know, and she was actually there to yeah. testify for the um, education sub subcommittee. And so, um, you know, I think what we've done in Citrus and Miss Simmel's uh, and staff have been very uh, proactive. I think we've been ahead of the curve, but this continues to. Um, Put us there and, and gives us information that we can use. So I mean, I'm I think it's a great thing, and it'll be interesting to work as we work on the guidelines because the yep. law that's 7011 is going to pass. You know, it's going to set requirements for the FHSA to set the guidelines. Well, right? the, there is, and, and I'll be very candid in saying that it is far from a perfect legislation. Uh, when we look at when when we look at that wet bulb low temperature, um, if you think about the four quantities I mentioned that it was derived from, wind temperature, sunlight, and humidity. Take wind. What if you go out and make a measurement at a time when the wind just happened to have kicked up? Okay, and but, but that was like sort of an anomaly for that day. So you're letting your athletes participate even though you took that one reading at a time when there was anomaly. So that's why in our guidance, we're actually trying to show what is the trend bend over the, every minute for the last hour. And I think there's definitely going to need to be massaging and tweaking to this legislation to have guidelines. Well, if you're making a measurement and you're calling a practice or a game based on those measurements, what are the guidelines? Is it, you know, do you take three measurements for 15 minutes? Do you take a measurement, you know, every 10 minutes for half an hour? So we want to, I'm a meteorologist, that's actually my, my background. I and my team want to be involved in helping answer some of those questions. We don't want to use our school districts as guinea pigs in doing that. Okay, but, but at the same time, we want to be, you know, we want to be very boots on the ground and work with our partner districts to answer these questions conservatively. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm very happy and pleased that we're going to have all the information. You know, probably the one thing in my mind that I think we're going to have a question on is the lightning issue, sure. which is not in the statute, um, but deal with lightning because that is something that um, we, we um, I don't remember, Sam, you may know, did we ever have a lightning detector here? I know it was discussed a long time ago. We discussed and we never found it. Yeah, yep. so um, there's issues, or, or there will have to be discussions on that, as, as you're showing how far the nearest lightning strike is and, you know, how do we get the word out and follow a consistent... Uh, uh, another neat part of the program is uh, on the interface of the program, if you click on the number that tells you how far away the lightning is, it'll open up this pretty cool feature, if I do say so myself, that we call our zap map, okay? So this actually is gonna show me in real time 
where lightning is happening all across the planet. And you can obviously zoom in. So for instance, I just saw a couple bolts that occurred out here in the Gulf of Mexico. And the atmosphere is pretty quiet right now over North America. But if I was to move to another part of the planet, like over, you know, you can always depend on a lot of lightning going on here in, um, you know, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, this part of the world. So, you know, you can, you know, long story short, you can really zoom in and, and see where lightning is relative to your sites of interest. And from a legislative standpoint, the, the NCAA guidelines have for many years used an 830 rule, that if lightning comes within eight miles of the venue, you have to suspend practice or competition for a period of 30 minutes. Okay? Now the thing about this weather stem program is because our, the, the cool thing about it is we're using a lightning data model that's used by a lot of bit like Amtrak, Federal Express, UPS, <laughs> and it's a global lightning model. So you'll be able to use, so if one of your high schools has a game in another county, your trainers will still be able to use this to keep an eye on lightning situations that might be adversely affecting the, the situation. So, And I, I was at a high school football game. Uh, this was not a business event I was at, this was a personal event. I won't mention the county I was in. Um, but there was actually a, a lightning off in the distance, and I saw with my own eyes a trainer doing the one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, as a determination as to you know if the game between the two teams and it was a big high school game on a Friday evening should be suspended. So we hope to be one of the people, one of the companies that can come in and provide more of a sound technological decision making tool in those potentially very life threatening situations. Um, first of all, I appreciate <clears throat> what WeatherStem has been doing and working with us, and I think that, that this does offer a lot. A um, couple clarifications. Sure. Um, House Bill 7011 has passed the House. Oh, okay. It, it passed yeah. the entire chamber. Okay. And actually, the wet bubble was removed out of the legislation. Oh, was it really? It was. Okay, now, thank you. I didn't realize it that. Wasn't, it's not to say that, that they aren't, the expectation is not to monitor it. They just changed some of it to the monitoring of that. And I think the concerns are what you talked about. Yeah. It's what, what does that look like? What you know? What are those specifics and those parameters? And I think they're they're hoping that FHSAA really kind of works on a more national scale, sure. um, using the you know the National High School Association as a guideline and and, um, and other organizations. So I think that the the legislation now has been referred to the Senate in so in messaging. Mm -hmm. So now the Senate can um, they can either come up and start a beginning, which in three weeks left of the session, I doubt that's going to happen. They will likely either vote on that and approve it, and then it'll go to the governor, or it will die. And I think the likelihood is that it's going to get uh, incorporated and, and pass in its current form. It, it, its current form, what made me feel good is, and again, Superintendent, Mr. Dodd, uh, this board, we're really, there's almost nothing that this board, that this legislation has in it that we aren't already doing or have been you know, working towards. Uh, we, while it's not perfect, we do wet bubble right now, and we actually daily, our, our, um, uh, our athletic directors are sending out the very information that you uh, talked here. Um, you know, here's an email chart where uh, it goes out and it tells, you know, our, our coaches what they should and shouldn't be doing. The challenging part of that is that takes man hours to do it. It takes one of our staff members to go out there assuming they are in school today. If not, then they've got to arrange somebody else who's qualified to do that, to check the readings, and now it's only based on that geographical area. Um, so it's limited by that. And, and then make sure that that gets distributed and so forth. So I think this streamlines that. It means that that information is going to flow no matter if nobody's on campus. It's gonna, we're going to get that information. One of the things that's good about the lightning, and this counts and I know because we're part we're of aquatics, <laughs> so we live and die by yes. lightning, yes. Um, no pun intended, but um, the challenging thing is we have had lightning detectors and they are not very reliable because they've got to be maintained, Yes, they have to be certified, they are only really telling you the atmospheric conditions in that, you know, that vicinity that it's monitoring where this being satellite based gives you a much bigger picture of what we're talking about and because it gives, it gives the alerts to the right people i think that 
Um, largely speaking, I think this is a bargain for the type of service that we're going to be getting uh, for that. So I, I'm I'm excited about it. Um, I, I think the you know the I think the plan is right now for the high schools. Is that correct? Of what You're this is? Segueing right into my question. Yeah. So that's the <laughs> uh, so I will I will pause and let you go um, ahead, but. I'm, I'm excited about this, and again, I think the legislation is not binding us, but rather um, giving us opportunities to, to, to do better. Okay. Mr. Bryant wants to go first. Before you, before you go there, I think I know what you're going to ask, and I think that our middle schools play at our high school campuses, don't they? Well, that was my question, and we have, we have very, like, Coast River Middle School, Coast River High School are within four blocks of one another, sure. um, and they usually do play at, at the high school. So. I was looking at the, the number six mm -hmm. that you're putting in. So where the six are going and, and here selfishly, our swim team at Coast River High School swims at Bicentennial Park with the antiquated lightning thing that goes off and the it's, it's sky, the sky is blue and you know, but the kids are out of the pool. So that's miles away from the school. So where are these six installations going to be? Well, um, we would be working very closely with Mr. Bishop and his team to make those determinations, but we would not be in support of, you know, having two at schools right next to each other. Okay. Um, that just, you know, you, you can... I, I talked to uh, Mr. Bishop about that. Okay. So okay. I think the, the, you know, three high schools, four middle schools, that's seven, but, I, but what he told me with the Canton School Complex, we only have one. Mm -hmm. But practice is a critical part of this. Um, you know, when the football team has practice, when the mm -hmm. running club or the cross country teams yeah. have practice. So that's why, I mean, it's, you know, we've got to consider our middle schools that are governed by FHSAA, we're member schools for our middle school program. So that's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, because that, cross country uh, runs six, all six, over the city of Crystal six, River. Yeah. And we swim at the YMCA and we swim at, at Bicentennial yeah. Park and Blue Spring Pines. Yeah. Um, and that's away from our campuses but so you have that capacity though for us to reach out miles from where your site is going yes, to be located. Yes, partic yeah. partic I mean, particularly with Lightning. Centennial Pool and know what's happening there. Yeah. With Lightning, uh, the Lightning system is decoupled from the actual equipment. Okay, mm -hmm. we're using a satellite and a worldwide Lightning network. Okay, okay? whereas something like temperature I mean that is you're, you're basically making a measurement at a particular point in space. Okay, so um, you know you can infer uh, what the temperature is blocks, and but as you start getting toward miles, the reliability of being able to say, well, the temperature of this location is X, this far away it must still be X. That drops off as you go away. But for all practical standpoints, if you have two schools that are literally right next to each other, down the block from each other, it does, in my opinion, it does not make sense to have that infrastructure overhead and that there's also a branding component to this program because these systems are all oh you know we made a decision very early on is we want this to be a tool that serves the public so all of these systems have a mobile app and a website that is open to the public and another neat thing about it if i do say so myself is each time we set up one of these things it gets its own facebook and twitter page so for instance this system here this is the um the, the Facebook page for the Marine Science Station's weather station, and it has 943 followers, which, I mean, isn't bad for a, a weather station's Facebook page, but what you'd see on it if it loads is, um, you know, forecasts, daily weather summaries, uh, you know, what did the sky look like at sunrise, um, if there were any severe weather alerts. Uh, they would automatically be dispatched here. So we, what we found is, a, especially in a lot of rural counties that are further away from like a, a National Weather Service airport, mm -hmm. we found these to be very popular as far as a way to get real-time information disseminated out to the public. Yeah. Uh, that's the great thing. All this will be available to the public. The yes, yep, right. absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and you know, my very quick personal, if I could just take a very quick, tell you how the I came up with the idea for this program. Um, I live about a half a mile away from the public elementary school where all three of my kids went. And my oldest son is autistic. And um, one of his routines every morning is he wants to walk to school. He wants to walk to school, he wants to walk home from school. So there was one morning, me and all my wisdom as a meteorologist was convinced it was going to be 70 degrees and sunny. It was 50 degrees and raining. So we got to school and he was in kindergarten and he was shivering. He was, you know, and the other parents were looking at me like, what an idiot, you know, guy doesn't even know how to dress his kid. 
So um, when I got back home, I wrote a little program, because I'm a programmer, that sends me a text message every morning at 7 o'clock. It tells me what's the high temperature, what's the chance of rain, and what's the temperature going to be when I walk home from school. And then I never misdressed him again. And then that got, me th that got me thinking, maybe there's an opportunity to have weather monitoring technology at a school that could serve a number of purposes, and that sort of came up with the light bulbs, and you know, here I am five, six years later uh, with the, fortune of the, the good fortune of talking to you all. Well, I just like to, because we do have cross country, and that's, that's a spring sport, and that's hot weather. Yes. They're, they're running miles away all from over the school. All over. And, um, and then we have the swim teams that are off campus too. Not that I don't love football players, but there's other sports too. Ms. Powers? Yeah, I just want to ask a question. How will the information get out to the public if they can access it? Yeah, uh, well we try to, whenever we set up one of these systems, uh, we try to reach out to the local media. Um, we also, if you ever watch the Weather Channel, we make our camera feeds available to them. So if you watch the Weather Channel, you'll sometimes see the Marine Science Station cameras being broadcast if they're covering a weather event that's in that area. Uh, and we also would, would welcome assistance from the Citrus County School Board to you know, maybe perhaps uh, have a posting on your news release section to let the community know about this resource so they can find it in their web browser, bookmark it, download the app. So we really take a partnership-oriented approach to make sure that the community knows about it, knows what the benefits are, and that, return, that increases the ROI for everyone. The cameras yes, sir. Um, that they're they're showing. Are we talking about them having cameras at the schools? Yes. And if so I guess what my concern is is that we need to, you know, I, I think somewhere where uh, you know Chief uh, uh, Chief Grant or uh, someone needs to work is to limiting what they're they're looking at. Yes, sir. We don't want those to be a, a situation where we have a safety. Yeah, I mean, this, this, you can see an example. This is the camera view from Escambia. It's um, sort of gives you an idea clearly of what the weather conditions are, um, but you're not going to be able to recognize someone. Yeah. Um, and we work with the school to make sure that the camera view is something they're comfortable with. We don't want it to be used as something that can be used for nefarious purposes at all. Um, we do feel that if, if you tell your stakeholders that there's a severe thunderstorm watch and that there's significant severe weather that might be expected, it takes it to a whole new level when you can say, wow, look at how dark the clouds look just west of Lakanto or one of the other sites. So we do think that the, the camera has a use to it that is situational awareness. And, and another thing from, a, uh, from an educational standpoint, what happens is, is every night at midnight, we take all of the pictures that were taken during the day and we consolidate them into this, what we call sky movie. And um, you know, that is sort of, a, you know, has, has a lot of purposes in teaching, uh, you know, educational value. So we do think the cameras are a very valuable part of the program and we would, you would expect our full cooperation in making sure that any camera views were well within your comfort zone and then some. Oh, I'm sure there was, yeah, I'm sure Lindsay can do Okay. So, uh, I thought it was interesting, because I, and I like how this can just stay up on the, the legal side of the law, but, you know, I, they took the, the, the wet globe out, right? Yeah. But yet, this is what they have. They have, you know, heat stress must be determined by measuring the ambient temperature, you yep. wind speed, sun angle, and cloud cover. <laughs> and what's the ice going to be? It's not going to be a wet bulb. It's pretty much going to be yeah. wet, but I think they were trying to get away from the yeah. name. And, and that, the, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm a meteorologist. And when I was first approached about this wet bulb globe temperature nearly five years ago, I had never heard of it. And I'm a meteorologist. So I think that if that legislation passed and it had wet bulb globe temperature, I think it would cause more confusion. Yeah, right. I think it would do more harm than good. Well, so, I believe it's all about they want to have more love. <laughs> so, even though from a from a business from a business perspective, you know my company would benefit because we've done so much research. If there was a legislation that you have to measure wet bulb globe temperature, my business would benefit. Even despite that, I think it's the right call to remove it from the legislation. At this point, there's not enough public education, and that's what I think they were trying to do. At the, at the, but that's what I, I did. I saw that too. It was it, to me it was the same thing without branding it. Yeah. Uh, you know, a WBGT. Yeah, I
motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the um, general service agreement between the school board of Sims County and Weatherston Incorporated. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Dodd, a second by Mrs. Bryant to approve the general service agreement between the school board of Citrus County, Florida, and Weather Street, Inc. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're, we're very blessed and we will work very hard to earn your trust and uh, perform. Yep. Yeah. And this is no disrespect to our emergency management that we have in Citrus County that gives us clues to bad weather, but I like it being very specific to our areas and our time. Thank you for the opportunity. Going to approve the instructional and support recommendations on the Golden Rock. We have in addition a last minute addition that I'd like to approve. It is under resignation for instructional. Yes, ma'am. Move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for um, instructional and support. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Powers, a second by Mrs. Okay. By Mr. <laughs> Thomas, and a second by Mrs. Powers to approve the instructional and support recommendations on the Golden Rod as superintendent. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Golden Rod accepted. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. I like the long list, Ms. Swain. Not a point. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Attorney legal matters? Any other business that needs to come before the board? Yes. No, you go. I just wanted to, um, and I know you all know this, but there's lots and lots of conversations going on in Tallahassee about teacher salary. Um, you know, the House has a set one way, the Senate has a set another way, but we spoke to uh, Senator Monford yesterday, and there's lots and lots of conversations on how the students are going to be able to meet that, because if it comes through as is, um, the district's looking at probably about $5 million shortfall, maybe six, trying to meet for all teachers, because what's happened, the, the dollar amount that they, they tentatively budgeted for us is like $2.6 million. Well, that is because they're going by what they're requiring as full-time FTE, which does not include TOSIS, but it's going to be a teacher who is a support teacher. So for us to bring everybody up, that's about what um, we're budgeting right now. Those are rough numbers because, you know, we don't know what the law is going to tell us to do. So I talked to other superintendents. They're also waiting here. You all know that um, here's the issue with Sumter, and I'll pick on little Sumter. If they were to go to 47.5, we need to be there too, or we may lose 860 teachers. So um, the good news is the conversation in Tallahassee is all about teacher salaries. And that's <laughs> never happened before. So on the flip side of that, that's a great thing. So we'll keep you posted. I mean, I know you all watch legislation. You watch the buzzing. I know that. So we'll keep you all posted as we look at how we're going to try to do that. Okay? And Sam, one of the things that, um, that I know that uh, on that one, and I don't know if our staff's seen this yet or if we've looked at it, there was even some talk that federal employees or employees that are paid under Title I were not 
Correct. figured in there as and well. Some of the ones that, and, you know, and that's a big number for us. So, I mean, when you... Right. That's why, that's why we took all of our teachers, because we're not, we're going to make it as equitable as we can. Because I think it won the House version, not the Senate, but the House, I think we were roughly, it was, we were in like the mid-800 faculty, you know, st um, instructional staff that we said would be impacted. And I think the House said it was like in the mid-500s. That's because they're not including all of these. But I mean, that's, right. that's a lot. Right. I mean, that's a huge difference right. in numbers. So um, this... So we're, we're not going to, um, <clears throat> we're just kind of watching it until that final gavel gets in. And I think we all keep trying to say, we so appreciate what they're doing. We really appreciate them trying to bolster teacher um, pay, and, and we want it to be equitable. We want it to be reasonable in, in that it does not have negative impacts in other way or areas. And so, uh, so, and I don't think they do either. Yeah, they do. I, I don't think they we'll do. We'll keep it on. But you're saying we have to meet whatever is passed, and so then we'll have to find a way to get back to We'll have to find the money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Plus, with the FRS um, piece that they're saying, instead of doing three-year increments, they'll want that in a one-year increment, and that's going to cost us about $1.2 million. And I think one of the things that they were saying that, that people are forgetting about the retirement We've always had a retirement, an FRS increase. It's been in the range of about 25 million on an annual basis. This year, they're talking about 233 million. And that's a little bit different. Um, I think when they said, when you divide that amount by the number of public school students, it comes out to about $73 a student. The BSA at best is looking at increasing by $50. So that's. That's another piece of this. So, but I, again, I appreciate, you know, Representative Pizzullo has been listening, I think, to those conversations. I know, Sam, you've been in contact with, you know, Mumford and, um, and Simpson, and they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. So I do think they're trying to find a way through this. Are, are teachers aware of this? Are they up to date on what's happening in terms of money? Some of them are. Some of them are busy teaching. Yeah. Yeah, still got, you know, one can't get a new chalk. They're also in here to the fact that really the last 48 hours up there in Tallahassee are when everything's going to come out, and so there isn't any sense in getting all bothered about it right now. It is what it is. Do you have anything else? No, I'm, 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 I'm good. Good, thank you. It's just one little thing, every one of you got this. It's an uh, invitation for the seniors of Lacanto School of the Arts, International Baccalaureate and Advanced Placement Programs to attend a presentation on art and we'll see what they do. Okay. That's our first idea. Tuesday, March the 10th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the College of Central Florida. And it's the big room that we always go to. They always have an incredible presentation of art, an incredible, you can spend a little forever there, but I don't want to get everyone's way, but it's really, really a good presentation. So I hope all of you, you have a chance and go to this. What time is it? Uh, it's at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's Tuesday, March okay. the 10th. Okay. And very much worth a while. Right. And to see really how gifted, how talented <coughs> these students are. Mm -hmm. I was in Pleasant Grove yesterday morning, and um, I think it was their fourth and fifth graders. They made little ceramic cupcakes. They look real. You bit one. I want to. We do have a school board meeting that day, right? Yeah. Yeah. March 10th. Yes. Yes. We do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. We do. Six. six to eight. Yes. So we get done by five thirty. It's all right. We're fast. fast. <laughs> Okay, and I, I have to end with, uh, you know, we have so many things that, that our children do well. I, I walked out of the literacy night with Forest Ridge looking at artwork on their walls, and I said, we could sell some of this stuff. Maybe the teacher would do this. And, um, but we also had the African American readout yesterday, and Mrs. Bryant wouldn't say anything, but she did a beautiful job reading. And the committee asked for students from Citrus County, and we yes, delivered. We, <laughs> we had more. We had more kids, and they brought down the show. The the they had a group from um, Seven Rivers, 
that did a pro presentation that was awesome. Ina Hassey was there and, and was, I said congratulations and we're so proud to have you in our school system now. But um, I think we almost doubled the amount of readings. Um, and so the kids did us proud again one more time. So I just, I just so, I'm so happy to be serving Citrus County Schools. Okay, any other business? Call for the no business before, so we meeting is adjourned. And without a break, we're going to workshop. Madam Chair, sure. I um, I would like to um, I would like to ask if you would consider moving the pay school for girls up. I know they have two representatives here. I know, and we had a we had I'm sorry we had our first meeting was a little bit over, and so yes, I that would be fine with me. If Mr. Dixon is used to waiting all the time. <laughs> pace, come forward, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> I know, right? My name is Sheila Jordan. I am the uh, executive director of PACE. PACE Center for Girls of Citrus County is our full name. Um, I'm just sharing our most recent, what we call our impact report. Um, a source of pride is the page that you can pull out, which is uh, kind of a one pager, but it, it is Citrus's first, what we call Fast Facts, and it features our first Citrus Pace Girl, um, Fast Facts with the Citrus Pace Girl on it. Uh, Pace Center for Girls of Citrus County. Um, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you guys. Two years ago, um, you guys approved um, the opening of Citrus, um, Citrus as a case center um, with, I know, much support from Senator Simpson and Representative Masulo. I remember um, last late November, early December, I came in for a meeting with uh, Dr. Hebert and I happened to meet um, I miss him at the time and we were saying we don't know if we'll get these girls or what it'll do we're going to give it our best shot and um, we opened the school in January we opened with eight girls which we later learned was history setting for Pace. Pace had never opened a center with eight girls it had always been about four so um, so we opened to much fanfare from the Pace side um, in the center that is now um, that is the school that it also is also shared with the Renaissance um, School or Sermi. So we now, from eight girls on January 7th, 2019, we are today serving 46 girls uh, and have to date served 91 girls um, in a full day program um, where they have the full array of academics, middle school and high school grades six through 12. Uh, they they receive their full uh, programming of school through through that throughout the day. In addition to, we have three full time counselors who provide at least um, one one individual counseling session bi weekly, one monthly parent contact, including a home visit, and then crisis services for any time the girl needs. Um, to be pulled out of the classroom because she's not able to do what she needs to. Maybe the girl isn't coming to school because there's trauma happening in the family. Um, maybe there's an addiction issue. We have girls who have been victims of um, sex trafficking. We have girls who have seizure disorder, so maybe they can't come to school because that can't be handled. We have girls who are bullied or girls who are the bully. We have <laughs> girls who are uh, who have issues like um, ADHD or ADD, um, runaway, runaway issues. Some of them just have focus and attention issues that we may not be able necessarily to know immediately what the cause is. Um, kind of the underlying issue is there's always some um, academic problem in addition to usually trauma, some kind of um, trauma, again, or mental health challenge. So for uh, a girl to attend PACE, she has to be in middle school or high school, have that mental health or trauma in addition to an academic need. So we've served 91 girls in what we call our day program. We also have a model that we call REACH, where we have placed two therapists in Crystal River Middle and Crystal River High. 
um, and they provide therapeutic services to the girls on site at the school. So those girls do not need the academic support, but they need the therapeutic support. And we've so served over 125 girls through those, those services. So they still get the PACE model of services, which are um, gender-specific, trauma-informed, and strength-based. So they still get those services. So we are serve, have served in this year of service over 200 girls with that specific model of, of services here in Citrus County. So we are um, blessed and fortunate to have really the, um, the pace across uh, the state as the 21st center. Everyone touts Citrus as having the absolute best partnership with the school district. So I want to make sure that I say that because the um, partnership that gets us in the building that we have with the services that give our girls um, the continuation of the free and reduced lunch services that they get without us having to hire staff to do that, the services that allow them access to transportation, that allows them to get to school, which is a major problem, of course, you know, for girls that have the challenges that our girls have, the same challenge other pay centers face with getting their girls to school. So our girls having access to those buses that go to the Lacanto complex means everything to the girls that come to school for us. So I thank you guys for that. Um, uh, Mr. Hebert and Ms. Kitt are um, at our building or on the phone with us or email when there's a student who might be a good referral for PACE or who we might, they might be a little bit more than we're set up for. <laughs> so, so they are also, uh, well aware of the services we provide. So I just, I'll just i just say that all of the departments that we have worked with at the district have worked with us beautifully and I think made the experience seamless for us, but also for the girls who, are, who have come to us. So uh, we also, which I think is unprecedented in PACE history, had our first student graduate um, within our first year open. And so in December, we graduated our first student who came to us after Pace being her fourth high school. Mm -hmm. So um, we were able to celebrate that with Ms. Himmel and Dr. Heber came over and I think maybe <coughs> seven or eight people from the district. So it was really, really a big, big moment for us. So I just wanna thank you guys all. I hope that you all, you have an open invitation to visit us any time of, uh, any time of the day. We try to make it a fun place. It's a school, but it's, it's still kind of a fun place. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's still kind of a fun place. Um, but our doors are always open. Another thing I wanted to share with you is in the six months, the first six months that we were open, we try to do something celebratory um, every month, or we do do a celebratory event for our girls every month. We also try to make sure parent involvement, of course, at every school is always a challenge. In our first six months, we had over 100 parent visitors for celebratory events for our girls where they actually came in either a parent an aunt a grandparent an uncle a counselor we try to keep their referral sources or school counselors involved with them over 100 in our first six months so that's always also important for us too any questions just that uh, we are so grateful for what you're doing um dr heber um miss humball mr mullen in a lot of situations is always uh, reminding us, you know, that pace, you know, where this might be a consideration for pace. We would love to celebrate with you. So when you have a graduation or you have a special event, please send us an invite because I know we try to make our graduations and we really want to support these girls and we want to support you all. We'll do, we'll do for sure. <clears throat> We didn't even know how to make the graduation. I was like, I weren't, we weren't prepared for this. Well, we can help you up. <laughs> and know that, that all of our schools, high schools, have extra gowns in the back room for our kids, so we can share them with you too. We ordered some off of Amazon. We really weren't. We weren't. Oh, we have them already. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Going back to Mr. Dixon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have uh, five policies to workshop today. 
And let me let me stop you right now. Do you want us to um, stop you on any one of the questions, or do you want us to? Yes, because it's still okay. workshop. And we're not. So. This is just for information. It's we're not going to go right now. Just don't go that out. So we're just going to work right through the discussion. Okay, I'll try to be as quick as. Uh, the first one is uh, policy 3.14, suicide prevention. This is a new policy that's required. It was reviewed in November by the Policy and Forms Committee, so everything in it is underlined. And um, Ms. Humbaugh is here as well if you have any specific questions about any provisions in the policy. Ms. Humbaugh is here, but I can Ms. also oh, tell you. She just yeah. said that. Okay. But yes. I didn't see her. Is this likely still a work in progress legislatively and, and rule-wise where we're going to pass this, but we will probably have to amend it here before too long? I have seen some proposed legislation that may impact this that's out there now. And it doesn't mean that we would slow yes. Yeah, but it, we, we probably will have to do some adjustments to it. We'll proceed. I had a question on number four. Now, they said before he's uh, studying a two-hour continuing education program with youth suicide awareness and profession training, etc., etc., and some time later on it talks about um, for everyone. Right. So who is giving it, who's presenting it, when is it presented? I know this is policy, it's not yeah. um, this is actually something that we already do. Ms. Humbaugh, I don't know if it was her originally that set it up or, or her you know, folks before her, but every new hire that comes on to our um, Citrus County schools does take a two-hour suicide awareness and prevention training. So it's part of new hire orientation. Um, so that is something we already do, and it actually is one of the approved ones from the Department of Ed. It's an online program. Mm -hmm. And those who are employed have already been employed, not new hires, uh, this has been going on. Every mm -hmm. one of us has done it. Yes. Every one of us. We started it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It tracks the statute. So on number five, um, you know, we continue to see these increased number of Baker Acts in our elementary schools. And, you know, I strongly believe that if, if parents are involved, and number five talks about contacting the parents, but, you know, there is a voluntary Baker Act over involuntary. Are we offering that if a parent comes, if, we've been no, if we notify the parent of the, the threat, um, are we going to give parents an option to voluntarily take their child from Baker Act? That happens now. So, yes, when parents are contacted, sometimes they do come to the school and choose to take the child themselves. Um, ultimately, it's that law enforcement on the school campus that would make the ultimate decision. So I can't say in 100% of the time there's not some overlap between when law enforcement makes that decision and the parents arrive. Um, but I have heard of cases that happen where the parents do come and voluntarily take well, their children. With live stream, I mean, uh, this is what my hope is for the mobile response team, that still our numbers are so high. It's, it's surprising that you know, we're not able to come up with, other, with alternative solutions to that. So I would really encourage staff to start looking more at those options. Um, and it's very clear here that we're going to contact the parents mm -hmm. sending the signs of, of suicide. Some of these may be very minimal risk cases. Right. And if parents are going to be able to, if parents are willing to step up and, and, and help their child, that would be, for me, a great option for us to look at. And I hope the sheriff's office and Lifestream and the school district are working together uh, to address those possibilities. And, and I would agree with that. We also have, um, when it doesn't rise to a Baker Act, there are certain procedures that the school will follow for um, injury, self-injury, or potential suicide. And those resources are still given to parents, even though that may not rise to a Baker Act. So the parents are always contacted whenever there's a potential suicide that's out there. Um, and then just continuing on that number five, those two instruments that um, are in this policy, we have already been reviewing and actually met with the Sheriff's Department too to some initial conversations on what that's gonna look like for our school system using those two instruments. Um, I know HB uh, 7083, which by the way has been now adopted into a committee bill. That's the Baker Act modification by Representative Webb who spoke to us. And there's some good things I know she's trying to do, but one of the concerns that we had, um, Mr. Mullen shared with me, and is that instead of just parent notification, they were basically wanting us to hold up 
the Baker Act. And so I had reached out to Webb's office and, you know, because the concern I'm sitting there going is, well, we don't, we don't have that authority. <laughs> and they wanted the principal to say, well, before they leave campus, you will contact them or they basically aren't going to leave. That's been taken out. I think they finally got the message, yeah, that, that's not going to work. And I think it's what you're saying, Mr. Dodd. It's, I, I absolutely, we want that buy-in. I suspect we have, as a school system, had already tried to have contact with getting that buy-in from those parents. But there comes a point where our authority is limited into what we can do. And that's what I do worry about with some of these legislation fixes, is it's putting it back onto the school district to say, you, it's, this is now your issue. And, and I think law enforcement has struggled with Baker Act to say, okay, you, you kind of thrown this onto us. Right. At least that's the way it looks like. And it, it's a hot potato. And in the meantime, we're just trying to, to get a solution. So I, pr I think the policy is as right now is is you know appropriate for what we're talking about doing. But I I really hope that the legislators look at Baker Act more closely because I don't think much has changed in the last two years, but the entire use of it as a tool is just, uh, it seems almost out of control. But Mr. Dodd hit the nail on the head when he said it's the relationship between all of us as entities, but the, the, the blame is gonna go to the Sheriff's Department. They're ultimately responsible for saying yes or no, and I have compassion for those SROs in our schools, and when a child says I wanna kill myself, and he waits, and then he's gonna be held responsible for not doing the Baker Act. But the challenge we have is, then they get Baker Act screened, we get them right back. Exactly. Yes. And then, and and then, have, and then that becomes, that burden but, shifts back to the school we, district to say, well, now you guys need yeah. to do something, and, and of course we're looking at live stream, and, and student services gets, you know, trying to, to find the so tools. So what I'm but, looking for right now with what we've got going in Citrus County is we've got the live stream, we've got the mobile rack, we've got policies. So can we work with with our Sheriff's Department and our SROs to come to some type of an agreement with when do you have to put this out? Because I understand the SRO's responsibility, but can he listen to counselors and teachers and principals and live stream before he makes that that determination? Well, that's the relationship I, issue I that you just yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. But you know, it is interesting to me because we're saying in five that they will be referred to a school-based mental health service provider and to perform either one of these two risk assessments prior to determining. So we're taking responsibility with that. I mean you know, right now, it's up to the law enforcement officer to make the determination. So are we now saying that in every instance, if there's a situation with a suicide risk and maybe a high risk, we're still going to do this, one of these two assessments. We're going to take the responsibility from our school-based mental health services up. And can you explain who they are in Sure, the, the plan for the school-based service providers would be school counselors, psychologists, and social workers. So those are the folks that would be trained in these two different tools. Um, as far as the law enforcement, and, and perhaps that's some language that needs to be added in, I don't think we're ever gonna be able to say to a law enforcement officer, no, you cannot Baker Act if it's, if it's them ultimately making that decision. Um, our, our plan is for this to happen sort of simultaneously. So when the law enforcement officer may come in with the school-based counselor and perform one of these tools, they're hearing the same answers from the student and know which will help hopefully where they should go next, where they should proceed. But if at some point the SRO says, no, I'm gonna Baker Act, I don't yeah. think that we have the power to say no. Mm -hmm. well, they do. I'm gonna take a look at that. That's not, that, that paragraph right there is not in the statute. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I wanna take a look at that as we're adding, because part of the statute says that no person has a cause of action unless there's against the school district, unless it's, it was caused by willful or wanton misconduct, and not when it comes to the position of that pair, that sentence there. Thank you, Ms. Bradshaw. And then I, if we do keep something there, I think we need to explain what the CSS RS and the safety, I mean, if it does go in there, let's spell out what that is. Um, or 
let's not put either one of them in there. Let's just say a, risk, a suicide risk assessment prior to. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the health services provider, when I read that, um, I think of someone, a provider outside of any, outside the school district. Okay. But, you know, I don't know if everyone does. Well, but maybe we need to specify that then in the word. I mean, yeah. So that it, it says school. Yeah. And the way it reads, too, it looks like we're slowing down whatever's going to happen, you know? Okay, we've got to call everyone together for this assessment. It, yeah, I mean, it does feel like it's a... Slow down. Mr. Bradshaw has redone this. Uh, well. <laughs> 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 oh, right. <laughs> I kind of modified it in, in my head and making some notes here about, like, the, the student can be referred to a school-based mental health service provider to perform those things okay. and, and striking out prior to determining whether there's going to be an involuntary. We're not going to make a call of an involuntary. You know, that's, that's simply, that's straight up the school resource officer's uh, responsibility, and, and I would like to see that come out so that, because uh, um, it, 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 it adds an additional, in my opinion, on the first read, an additional responsibility to us that a legal obligation that we're not required to Especially based upon the statute that says that you know we're not responsible unless there's a warrant or will to yeah. you know, this conduct. And so you don't want to add a add, 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 add a level, add another level of responsibility to us to give some of the other things that even just your policy set that's more than well. So we'll continue on to work on this. It'll be pretty good. Well, back to us or yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. come yeah. back to you again. It, well it need to come back at a at a meeting to be approved for advertising. With that, with that with the changes. Out. Yeah, with the changes, yeah. and then you and then you can all you can also at that point in time if you want to modify it a little more, you can we can do that, and then it can be approved the advertising. But I, I think that within it, the information has to be given to the school about what's going on. They don't have they don't bake a but they need to know what's happening here. So you're not going to take out the school knowing what's happening. No, but your policy can't dictate what other agencies. Right, right. Are. I can't dictate. Right. I can't dictate to the parents or, or right. the centers or live stream or anybody else that they're not getting the same information. Your no. policy would just be what you want the staff. To do. <coughs> no, right. There will right. be information given to them. That's that's what I'm saying. And to, uh, remind me, who, I, I'm who sorry. pays for the Baker Act? For the Ace for the Baker Act? Yeah, or child uh, is put into a facility. My, my, <laughs> guess, <laughs> my guess would be, yeah, it's for, and then looking at their insurances, perhaps, if it's something where they're staying. I kind of took that to say, like, you know, that's not a kid standing there saying, I'm going to be telling myself right now, but it was kind of starts to exhibit well, some the minimal. Yeah, and then you can yeah. tell that, you know, little John is there's minimal issues, right yeah. and, and, and you need to take a look at this. Yeah. <laughs> But two things, that's the question. Because I know it used to be, what it used to be was that it was given to the family to uh, charge. We, but, we uh, never see a charge. No. We don't pay for it. Okay. Yeah. Now, it kicks in if they start after that receiving the services. That's correct. You know, when they engage in it with, you know, insurance, Medicaid, et cetera. But, but a bill's not given to us, not to the family. No, ma'am. No. Mm -hmm. I'm aware So, oh, Mr. Dixon, sorry. I will tell you this. On this policy, I like the, the way it's kind of made up. I mean, you know, I talked a little bit about the censor policy that we're going to look at down the road a little bit, but this is more in line with what I was thinking that even the censor policy would be. But I just I thought I'd mention that to the board because mm -hmm. I like the way this gives us what we're committed to, you know, what we're going to look for, all those things. So I just thought I'd point that out because I might reference this <coughs> in a future in a future. Future policy. Well, this particular policy was recommended language from the EPEC, so I thought I appreciate it. We're going to bring it back to the proof for Yeah. Okay. And we'll coordinate with Mr. Yes. Okay, so the um, <coughs> next one is policy 3.40 Safe and Secure Schools. Now, this one you've seen a couple of times previously. Uh, the safe and secure schools policy, we made several adjustments to it uh, in short order. This is kind of a cleanup version to just 
We made the recommended changes from NEFEC. We made some changes uh, that Mr. Grant sent, or Chief Grant sent me early on. So this final update incorporates all of the additional information that we gathered through that process that needed to be added to the policy. And there's one change that we need to make on page eight. Sticking with Chief Grant under item 9b training and identification of threats including potentially violent behavior shall be provided to appropriate personnel at the schools not all mm -hmm. personnel at the schools okay. Okay. and just a scrivener's note in in two we need to to put a line through the word um hang on let me back oh active we've got shooter <clears throat> um, deleted, but we didn't delete the word active. On page 2 of 8? Uh, in section 2A, it's on page. It just says active. Oh, active assailant? Yeah. It says active and then shooters. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. and act, that active in front of shooters should be done. Mm -hmm. And that covers every kind of assailant. And um, Chief Grant is also here if you have any specific questions or I could move. All the ones I had, you, you answered there. I just yeah. want to emphasize one that if a child is under a threat assessment situation and leaves the school here under that, goes to another school, the other school has to deal with that too. The, uh, the threat assessment team shall verify that any intervention services provided to the student remain in place until the threat assessment team of the receiving school independently determines the needs for intervention services. Just like, you know, when we can spell people and yes. the spelling of one does and if it goes to another school, it's still under that. I believe that's uh, on page six of eight, number yeah. six there. Yes. And I did speak to Ms. Greco about that, and there is a folder that goes with the student so that the receiving school has all the information. I have one question. Yes. It's on page. It's on page seven, the last paragraph. It talks about in the event of emergency, superintendent is authorized to dismiss or close all schools. It talks about except the principal may dismiss the school and the superintendent does not need to be contacted and an extreme emergency exists in danger to health, safety, and welfare of the students. Any such action shall be reported immediately to the superintendent or designee along with a statement describing the reasons for the action. A little fuzzy on what an extreme emergency is and if it's an extreme emergency that the principal is making the call that they need to shut down the school at that point in time, would they not also need to be um, um, notifying the emergency agencies also. I mean, if, if a principal, if a principal is standing there and, and has to make a call that I'm going to shut down my school, that has to be something that I would think that it, it, it involves the health, safety, you know, where does it say that? So do you want? Do you think it need you need to add that they need to be contacted? Yeah. 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 Well, seven C is what you're talking about. So yes, yeah, yeah, seven C because it talks about you yes. know, that the superintendent. I mean, the su superintendent makes the call. Makes the call, but you're talking about a principal, you know, um, shutting down the school. <coughs> principal they dismiss the school when, when the superintendent doesn't need to be contacted. Can't imagine that would happen. But, but in an extreme emergency exists endangering the health, safety, and welfare of the students, why would I, I think that in that case, but if it's that bad for whatever reason, you probably need to contact the emergency response agency also. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I mean, if something like that is obviously going on, your SRO's there, he's going to be in contact with other, but if we wanted to add that language into 
you know, let's say for example, you all of a sudden uh, were notified of a, of a major gas rupture next to a school, right? And you know, we had to make that emergency decision to get those kids out of there. But your first responders, I think, we kind of assume are going to be involved. But if you wanted to add that in that language, that's that's not an issue. I just read it and thought it was an option. You're giving the principal a great deal of authority to shut a school down. I would can't imagine that, that would be a situation where you'd also be contacted with an emergency response at the same time. The appropriate emergency. The appropriate. Yeah, the appropriate. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question. Okay. On page um, six of eight, uh, down at the bottom, um, Seven. I got a question on seven and eight. Um, the Office of Safe Schools here is the same Office of Safe Schools that we reference. That's with the Department of, of Education, right? Right. Where are you now? Uh, seven. Page page six. Um, number seven at the bottom. Got it. I think there's only one Office of Safe Schools. Yeah. The right. So I guess my question though was, I thought the threat assessment team at each school is gonna to report to the district. Is it, uh, is it the threat assessment team at the school? Is that the, so the statute? I wasn't familiar with that in the statute. The each school's threat assessment team has to report to all the state schools? The threat assessment teams do report to the district. What this is referring to is there's supposed to be a database that's developed. We're, we're then supposed to report into this database. All right, well, let's um, put database in there so that we know, because, I mean, it looks to me like you're going to be reporting um, data. I mean, I, I thought you were going to be giving reports to the Office of State Schools. We're actually not sure, because it hasn't been developed yet, what will actually be the procedure to do that. So I'm not sure if the schools will be entering it in, or if it comes to the district so and the DOE be entering hasn't it. Set that. Correct. That, that deadline is coming past. And yeah. there's still not any guidance from DOE on this. And I think recommendations were due in December. Yeah. They'll set a deadline for you to do it in, in right. 30 days, and they'll set themselves a deadline six months. So we're still kind of waiting on how all this is going to look. Um, I talked to DOE recently about this specific <coughs> issue, and, and they're still trying to work out like what exactly they're going to provide. We have some training in June coming up. Uh, and we hope at least by then they'll have some better guidance for us uh, on this issue because right now it just says basically the statute's very similar to the wording in, in this policy, uh, but is, there's not been any further clarification from DOE on this yet. Mr. Okay. are you saying that they don't have to keep their deadlines, but we have to keep the ones that they set? Is that what you're saying? I'm not just saying, a question. I'm not <laughs> saying that they don't have to keep their deadlines. I'm, I'm saying they that don't. they don't meet their deadlines. <laughs> Can we? Um, can we just add in there, shall we report upon data on its activities to the Office of Safe Schools database? And according to the guidance from the office, I mean, it is going to be a database, right? We, we know that. Yeah, so. as far as whether it's electronic or paper, yeah. it doesn't really matter right now. Yeah. All right, and then on number eight, um, so the threat assessment team shall plan for the implementation and monitoring of appropriate interventions. And then we say to manage or mitigate the student's risk. Um, couldn't we just say to reduce the student's risk for engaging in violence? I mean, we're talking about we're going to have a plan to, and we're going to, for the implementation and monitoring, to manage or mitigate the student's risks for <coughs> Those don't fit too well with me. To manage or mitigate? I mean, to, are we, we, we going to actually mitigate? Are we actually going to mitigate the student's risk or... Well, they're helping them to, to commit violence. I mean, I think that's the, the goal of any kind of threat assessment. So how do we manage it, though? Well, it's by providing the intervention. So once the threat assessment is done and they determine that interventions are appropriate, to provide those to help reduce, I guess, the outcome. Yeah, that's what right. yeah, yeah, I, I so would clean it up. What's that? Diminish. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, or to diminish the, yeah. I, I, I think managing and mitigating, I, I, I'd rather just go with with one word in there. Yeah, manage doesn't really sound good yeah, in particular. <laughs> so I'll just insert diminish.
Anything else on this policy? The next one is uh, policy 5.09, requirements for original entry. Uh, we did just make some updates to this one, but we did, upon going through it, we noted a few other things that needed to be brought in line with the existing policy. Uh, in the first paragraph, you'll see any student who initially enrolls in the district shall be required to have on file with the immunization registry a certification of immunization and any child who is excluded from participation in the immunization registry must present or have on file with the school such certification of immunization. We changed the year in section A from 22 to 21 to be consistent and then we struck section 3 added the part on page two under section five with referrals to mental health services. Any questions on this one? Okay, uh, right now, this is very, very pertinent to the coronavirus spread. And to tell you the truth, we don't follow that policy all the time. We're supposed to have uh, the kids coming in they're supposed to be immunized. We're not supposed to give them a year to, to get the immunization. So I think overall something needs to be done and maybe they have to go to state level because this doesn't work properly. And certainly now with the coronavirus, it's a big issue. A person could come in, they could be sick, they could infect the whole blast at school, we do nothing about it. And I'm, it's always bothered me, particularly me. Right. We've cleaned it up. So we need to take it to the state, though. Why didn't we drop the, the 22 to 21? Don't we keep uh, the ESC kids until they're, they're 22? Yes. 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 Um, we do. That is what's in statute is why it was changed or along those lines. But those students who are part of what we're talking about, you know, in the uh, either the school or WTC, all of their records are already in there. You know, we've got all their immunization records right. and such. So what if we have a transfer of an ESC student and they're 22 and we have to take them in the new to our district? For ESC, it's up to the 22nd birthday. So mm -hmm. once they turn 22, then our services would end. So I'm okay. sure that's why. So, so okay, they're so they're up to 22. Right, okay. 22. right. They don't get to stay the 22nd year. Correct. Okay, right. good. Okay. Not good. Not good. Under 21. If you're 20, okay. so if you're not 22 yet, so tomorrow you're still. Yeah, but if you're under 21, you're 20. That's true. When you're 21, you're 21. So if they transfer when they're 21, so it should just take the word under out. So you're sort of 21 years of age you're right. or under. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Good. Thank Thank 21, you. yes. So 21 years of age or under. That's a good point. Any other discussion on 5.09? Just take it to the state. Okay. The next one is 5.32, zero tolerance for school-related crimes and victimization. Uh, there's only a couple of minor changes to our existing policy. Uh, page two of six in section B. Uh, law enforcement consultation is not required for petty acts of misconduct which are not a threat to school safety and page three of six section seven the school principal shall notify all school personnel of their responsibility to report to the principal or his or her designee crimes or incidents posing a threat to the school safety and ensure the incident is properly documented It. Those are all that's contained in the statute. If you'll remember correctly, when we changed the student code school conduct earlier, or last year, those were added to the code. Okay. 
final policy update is policy 8.10 safety. Uh, we concerted a paragraph. Oh, did you have a question on that last one? Yeah, I was going to mention it. <clears throat> and I'm glad um, uh, Mr. Bradshaw brought that up about the statute. But, um, you know, on page three of six, that Roman numeral eight that we just talked about. So what, what they're saying is that it's the responsibility of these faculty and staff to notify the principal if there's an incident posing a threat to school safety, right? Isn't that right out of statute, Mr. Bradshaw? Is that this is right out of statute, yeah. And, right. and what it is is the principal has to let them know that they can report it. Right. So if something happens, they, they have the right to, they, they can skip the principal, they can go straight to the SRO and make it. Right, that meaning his or her designee. Well, at, at one of the discussions was that they should, we should require like a, a hotline, right? To for that would require people to call in these threats, and that that didn't, that wasn't going to work because we have all these threats. That, who knows? I mean, is someone walking out in the parking lot, you know, between classes, a threat? So it was kind of really vague. So I'm glad. It, it, that we didn't go that route, but yet this does pretty much put our employees on notice that if they see something that is concerning to them, they need to report it, right? And that, to the principal or his or her designee, which I guess you're saying could be the SRO, which I agree. Yeah. So the, I, I'm just wondering how how is the school principal going to do that? How, how are they going to know it's just going to be like a faculty meeting? Well, I mean, this policy gets approved. Chuck will also send it out to all staff. And then, in addition, we'll just add it to the checklist of stuff that they do. Gotcha. That they, they, they yeah. sign that they, they have it. They sign that they yes. have okay. yes. So, this was in statute this past year, and we had to meet that requirement prior to the, coming to our policy. So, we had to certify to the state by October 1st that this was done. This was one of those things that the superintendent had to certify. So every principal, uh, during our principal meeting, we discussed it. We, I sent the statute out to them specifically. They went over that meeting and staff meetings, and they maintained the records, but they certified back to me, and I have every one of their emails where they've certified that this was covered with the quoted statute language with everyone in their staff. And I can tell you, some principals sent me the actual sign-in sheet of every single staff member, Others just sent me the email saying, I have covered this with 100% of my staff per Florida statute so that we met that certification and the superintendent was able to send that to DOE and we have to do that every year. every year. By October, this has to be covered 100% with the staff. So we did this last year and we're going to continue, right. you know, continue to make sure we meet that statute moving forward. And, and so, I, you know, the point, the point of it is, is that there's a responsibility here to notify, person, to notify authorities when there is some type of a threat that rises to their level of concern. Right. And I was talking to Chuck about a lot of this, and he kept reminding me that this is policy, this is not what you're supposed to do, this is uh, the general to say, that. but we do have to follow up like you're saying. And, um, you followed up by having everyone sign that they had mm -hmm. notified everybody else. So all, every single thing this policy, we have to follow it up somehow to say, be sure that it's done, even though in policy it doesn't say you have to do it, we still have to do it. Anything else? All right. And the final policy update uh, workshop is 8.10 safety. And this is the one uh, Mr. Dodd and I discussed yesterday. We inserted section four, uh, school environmental safety incident reporting, basically to say that the superintendent shall develop and implement procedures for timely and accurate reporting of incidents related to school safety and discipline and shall provide training to appropriate personnel in accordance with law and the State Board of Education rules. The district will utilize Florida School Environmental Safety and Incident Reporting, Sessor Statewide Report on School Safety and Discipline Data to report the 26 incidents of crime, violence, and disruptive behaviors that occur on school grounds, on school transportation, and off and at off-campus school-sponsored events to the Department of Education. And then you had said you might want to expand that. Yeah, I just felt like, 
I don't want this to appear like we're kind of just trying to stick it in somewhere. I mean, you know, we're talking about safety belts uh, underneath, you know, seat belts underneath it and stuff. I mean, this is a big deal. In our district, every indication I've seen, we're on top of this report, mm -hmm. aren't we, Sam? I mean, yeah, we're, we're, I mean yeah. compared to what I've seen on the Silver Douglas Commission and some other districts that they're, they're you know, not. So yeah. I wanted to say either let's take it out and put it into its own policy on Cessor or let's define it better. I mean, personally, I, I hate the way it's kind of set in here because it makes it sound like we're just trying to, I don't want to say hide it somewhere, we're trying to stick it in there. But this is a big deal. And so, I mean, there's there's legal standards on the school safety specialist has to has to review the data. You know, we want to be consistent. So what I'm it's saying is enough to bring it back as its own policy. I think if we talk to them. Well, I mean, I don't know why we wouldn't, because we're we're on top of it. It's not like it, but you know, we we this board needs to have a policy that we expect consistency in mm -hmm. reporting. That in which we're already doing that the training is being addressed by you know those people that are entering the data. That's part of the law. That the school safety specialists will will will, will review the information as annually, isn't it, buddy? Yeah, um, that, that's in the 3.40 uh, policy that we just went over. There's those two sections are are covered in that 3.40 as well. So about session. And then this does deal a lot with discipline. This is all discipline, right, Mr. Bradshaw? So would it be better, I mean, would it be better to put it in the discipline policy or would it be better to just have a policy on its own? Um, you know, because it is, I, I can tell you statewide, the assessor data is a big deal with districts. I know there's a lot of districts that were not reporting any assessor data. They, yes. So, um, I mean, it, it, it's a reporting of disciplinary events that occur on school. Um, when you say a discipline policy, are you like talking about the code of student? Uh, yeah, code of conduct, yes. Um, which is a policy. I would, yeah, you're right. We wouldn't have to print that all into the code of conduct. Yeah, but I think that you could do a separate policy. I mean, that's why I would do it. Well, if we can, we can look at, we can get, we can look at that, bring it back as a separate policy. Because I would rather it be a separate policy standalone and have it spread out in three different policies. Because then what happens is if it does get changed, it doesn't get changed everywhere, and uh, we end up saying we're doing two different things. What about guidelines? Would that be something that you might put the policy? It's not more approved. Yeah, guidelines are just procedures, so they're not. I might have missed it. The statute says that the board has to adopt policies to ensure the accurate time of reporting of incidents related to school safety. I think and then the school, the superintendent is responsible for school environment safety. I think what y'all are saying, you want to send a message that it's important enough that the state has its own sailor policy. And then I don't might have missed it, but then number two, is there a reason that we have principal and teachers and we don't have staff and guidance counselors mentioned in there? I mean, it's a, it, when you start, yeah. st start specifying particular areas, I'd hate to see, you know, you have to be, it either has to be everybody or. I can add something that just brings all in everybody else. All, all yeah. district staff. All district staff, that's, that's good, Absolutely. yeah. All school personnel. Yeah. And as far as you know, creating a standalone policy, I'll see if I can find something to use as a template, maybe. Okay. And then I'll. Can I, can I that concludes the policy updates for the workshops today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we're going to move to another one that we have to get done today. Um, that's the. Um, the other one. We always need always you. Always. We always need you. I usually leave after the work. After we we have got the instructional materials to do, the recycling presentation, five year work plan. Strategic plan. Stokes is here for the uh, recycling. Mr. Stokes, can we move you to the March meeting? Yes, ma'am. That's that fine. Okay four? That works. <laughs> Absolutely. Or do y'all want to come back after we well, I, you know, I have a lot of discussion on this, but, um, I, you know, I don't, I mean, I just, my concern is the county is working on the recycling project Correct. right now as well. As a matter of fact, I think it's scheduled to be on the meeting today. It is today. Um, and I'd kind of like to talk about the opportunities to 
you know, work with them or part with them. Now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, we wait, wait. See, maybe we'll wait I mean, to see what they do. Just a thought. Yeah. Hear what, what, hear what their reaction is. Yeah. Um, because I, I mean, I would love to recycle, but it's a cost factor, but there may be other options working with the county. Well, yeah. and then maybe, yeah, like Mike just said, you Maybe you could make a contact, or we'll see how this right. meeting goes see today, and then see if there's a way that we can come Are up. Are y'all okay with that? Yes, yeah, because I don't think we're You're ready right now to go to the but I think we all want something to happen. Yes. Are you okay with that, Mr. Stone? Yes, ma'am. And we know that you enjoy being here all morning. I've enjoyed it. It's been very educational. Wonderful. Hey, what we have in here, though, can we just say, say thank you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, with you, your team, off the chart, as always. Yeah. And we are very grateful to you, so thank you for all you did for Central Ridge and to get that back yes. online. Um, uh, your fingers hurt from the zapping? No, he has special gloves. Special gloves. <laughs> thank you, Mr. We don't want OSHA no, Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. All right, thank and keep in mind the PowerPoint is in the presentation so you can have the basics of the facts. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So please, next on the agenda then would be presentation of the 2020-2021 instructional material titles selected by committee for recommendation. Were, were we going to maybe wait on strategic planning? Or what, what were we going to do? Renee, what do you need us to do with that? that that's fine. I can hold off for another month. That's what, is that the summer strategic plan? Yes. So it's the piece that's going to be in the summer. Good morning. Uh, I just need a few minutes of your time. I wanted you to have the opportunity to ask questions before we go into public input next month. So let me just remind you of the process. In uh, August, we typically send a letter to all of the publishers that have submitted material to the state and wish to be considered for the adoption process. We then create committees. Uh, we have representation from the community on the committees and then representatives from each of the schools. They go, go through the process of evaluating the materials that publishers have submitted. And then once they have chosen um, the, the publisher, the top two or three publishers, those publishers come and do a presentation. They then vote again using a rubric that the committee has created. And then once they have chosen their top selection, their top publisher, we then come to you. We let you know these are the titles that the committee has chosen. And then that's what I'm going to do right now. And then the next step is we invite the public to come and provide any input that they may have. And then we will come back another time, the final time, for you to vote um, on the materials that we have considered as adopting for the year. So this year what we reviewed we reviewed world languages, which in this case was Spanish, and then we had one school that is offering Italian, so we had to review Italian. Okay, that, I, that was my question. I said, who's teaching Italian? The Canto High School. Oh, okay. And then we also had the career technical, and then computer sciences. So when you uh, see the attachment that was provided, the career technical is in computer science courses are a little bit interesting. They are in program clusters, so that's why we provided you the list of the program of study and then the textbook that was um, chosen by the committee for that program of study. So what I wanted to do is allow you an opportunity to ask any questions before the next meeting when we solicit public input. And I have experts with me today. I have <laughs> Bill Chamberlain. He is going to be available if you have questions for career technical or computer. And then I also have Mary Leonard for world languages. So did you have any questions today? The only thing that I've experienced uh, since I'm new on the board is that when these committees meet to review these books, they need to be told that square one, if you recommend it, and this is the book that you want, look at it very very carefully because you're going to get it <laughs> correct so so we had a couple of books adopted and then they got it in the classrooms and they didn't like them one of them was on the committee i threw that back in your face <laughs> and that's not an unusual one yeah i got a textbook and, you know uh after they start using it they some people don't like it but you're absolutely right yeah they take it seriously yeah they need to take it very very seriously because uh, we're last not time that, we bought a reading 
series was what, 11 years ago? Yeah. So you're going to have it for quite a while. Yeah. So just, just that's in charge. Just tell them to take it very seriously. If they don't want to be on the committee, then pick somebody else that wants to be on the committee. That is important, and, and we make sure that we emphasize that with the administration, but I, we could always emphasize that even more. And then the other problem is that it is it is a rubric. So they go in and they score the materials, and then we take the 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 overall score from the committee members to determine the two or three that will go on to the publisher presentation. And so then we do offer them the opportunity to have a discussion. These are the two or three choices that your committee recommended. Do you have any concerns? Uh, and then we have a lot of discussion at that point, oftentimes, because there will be that one person or one or two uh, members of the committee that feel strongly in favor or against a particular title. So it is a little bit of a democracy. I know um, we're, we're governed by some strict and continually becoming more strict um, guidelines of public input uh, for adoptions of materials. Particular to CTE, there is, there, we are governed also by certain programs. So like Project Lead the Way, is not the same as a adoption of a typical book. So we don't adopt it in the same way because we purchase the program or we buy a subscription to the program is my understanding. Mm -hmm. So the curriculum adoption is not really flows in the same classic way. Now, I don't think most of the public has, CTE is unique enough that it's probably not as controversial because a lot of times with CTE, it's not a core subject area. It's a, you know, a, a, um, cho a choice to go into that, and so it's it's not mandated like it would be reading math and something of that nature. Correct. It tends to be an elective. So, path. so I guess it is is project lead the way. You know, I think of biomedical, uh, the coding, um, even some of the nursing. Some I know you. There's some nursing here, but I know this is not complete. New EMT. All of that would fall differently and outside of this adoption, if I recall. Correct. Um, the Project Lead the Way courses, the, the Computer Science Academy, and the Biomedical Science were not part of the adoption because of that reason, that, that we purchased that program complete. So there's no guesswork. It, it has to be their material in order to be considered Project Lead the Way. Um, as for the the new EMT, it hadn't been decided before we did the adoption, so there was no book provided for EMT. That has to come with the new program set up. Uh, the nursing, we did choose a core book for the medical field because those programs are outside of the Project Lead the Way. The uh, biomedical science is part of their, their uh, academy. Okay, so we do have books for nursing, for dental, and a core book for the medical uh, academy. Excellent, thank you. Is the ag um, for high school agriculture, so there's more than one section of that, right? So how does that work with um, with high school agriculture and that, that textbook? Is that gonna cover all those classes? Yes, the, the, um, the, the books that were selected because there is a because there is a middle school book and a high school book. Uh, those were the, the the committees chose the books that would cover the broadest uh, sections of their combined curriculum. Okay. So therefore, the, the books will be useful in all of their courses, and then they'll supplement with whatever they need to make to uh, read for for instance horticulture or. Um, the agri-science portion. And, and actually we had 72 courses <laughs> that we put into clusters and then the committee chose the book that would work the best for that cl cluster and cover multiple course, multiple course codes um, for that reason because we have so many variants of courses that fall under this program of study. Those people from the community, you look the people who are uh, experience in, in the area, say like in computers, choose a computer book, or, or just general people, what do you look for? Yes, um, we, we, we asked the committee members to reach out to parents that they thought were 
going to provide um, good feedback on the material because the, the part of the issue with adopting a textbook is you send the kids home to do homework and the parents don't know what the book says. Uh, so we, tr we tried to get them in. Uh, we did not actually bring in um, businesses to review the textbooks. Um, we relied on our committee members, which um, in the CTE uh, cluster, clusters, we are supposed to be uh, reasonably well informed in the needs of our whatever our discipline is. So we, we counted on the committee members for the technical and the business um, alignment, and then we, we reached out to the public for the general public input on is it readable, is it something they can understand, does it, you know, does it flow well for the way their kids learn, that, that type of information. I was talking to a person yesterday who had been 42 years in computers, he worked for a very large company, and uh, the last about five years he went into the management portion of it and, and not the other. But he said those five years made all the difference in the world. He couldn't go back to the computer work that he'd been doing for 42 years because now everything had changed. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. Oh, wow. And then for our, our kids, as we son, it is. We, we do our best to teach the kids where we think our technology is moving, but technology is such a quick moving target. We, we can't always hit it. But that's also why it was important for the committees to evaluate the digital components of each of these publisher <laughs> offerings to make sure that they were going to be updated regularly. For example, the um, classroom and book, they regularly update once a year their digital components. And so even if the physical book becomes a little bit dated, the online version is updated. So we encourage that with our committees as well. Good to know. Okay. Any other questions? No French. No, I wish. But <laughs> we we. Right. I was excited that we have somebody offering Italian at least. So there's something you know. There's a little bit of a choice there, Spanish and Italian. Yeah. Well, we will see you next month when we have the public input. And just as a reminder, all of these materials are upstairs in the conference room so that you can uh, go in and look at them if you'd like. And do you have a question? No, I was just going to, when you were finished, I was just going to point out something. Yeah. And then for the public, they can call, it is on our website, but they can call 746-3437, extension 5901, to arrange to come in and look at the materials in person. <laughs> uh, no, but I will let the board know because we got that email from, uh, I think, uh, Ms. Reed about the Aviation STEM Academy and uh, Debbie Stanley, as he or she, we, we had a little meeting on that and it was it was kind of encouraging. Uh, yes, it was. And, and the, the way it was presented is, you know, they're, they're working on it on their end, they're, they still have some work to do, but... Uh, you so, yeah. yeah, it was very interesting. Um, we began um, with her telling us um, the inf um, resources available at our local airport, which I did not realize that they had a lot of planes out there. I have not been out there in a while. So they began to talk about, about um, some possibilities of having with the drones, having our students take um, the um, industry certification for drones, um, filing drones, as well as working towards possible um, flight, flight um, simulation, and possibly actually flying. So um, they, uh, we began to talk about like, as I began to think about which course codes would we use, and then I started thinking about contracts and you know all of the different things uh, that would that would need to be in place. So as we work forward, it would be something that we would be looking forward to next year but the beginnings um they told us the high school a couple of high schools that were utilizing the courses now and um we asked if they would put us in touch with some of those people that i could reach out to and so she's supposed to be emailing me back with that type of information i'd like to find out which course codes are they using um, who's teaching it what's the teacher certification those type of things so as i began to think about where we'd want to offer it, you know, where you're talking about just on this side of the county because you're talking about Inverness Airport. Would you think about the other side of the county because you have the airport and Crystal River? You know, there's it's just exciting. It's exciting when you think about the possibilities of what we could offer our students in the future. And 
um, like Ms. Stanley said, uh, they realize that you know you got to have these courses. They're already set for next school year, so it literally wouldn't be from, yep. not next school year, but the following school. Right, so right. It's going to give them time to work mm -hmm. on it. It gives us a chance to look at some things, and you know, I thought it was it was pretty overall. I thought it was really. Kind of it gave us like a free thirty minute flight. Also, Doug and I got like a certificate to go, and I'm thinking, ooh, uh, so it'll be very interesting. But I was beginning to say that, that learning to fly, you have so many disciplines mm -hmm. that are in there, you know, the math mm -hmm. and the science, the weather that we were talking about. Absolutely. All of this, and mm -hmm. you don't have to know it by oh, answering the right questions. You've got to know it if you're in the air. You must know what to do. You yes, ma'am. It's real. So and yes, ma'am. get that scholarship in the Prince River Airport. Yeah. Yes, we mm -hmm. talked They about come back, yes. and, and it's, it's all year because they get the scholarship at the beginning of the year, and by the end of the year, the kids have their license. And that's all over that school. So you have a simulator there. Mm -hmm. And even thinking about drones, what the possibility of that for students for occupations in the future. I mean, it, I think Amazon and different places are delivering by drones already. And they actually talked about, and I was amazed by this. I think he said, did they say China, Doc, Mr. Dodd, that they were utilizing drones for transporting people? Like actually, they were unmanned a drone, but you would get in it and it would take you from point A to point B and it's actually occurring as we speak. So that's that's amazing. So thank you very much. All right. Last but certainly not least is our lady that's fertilizing that money tree. <laughs> <laughs> Himmel and Mr. Kennedy pretty much did my whole presentation, so because um, we want you, we want you to go as fast as you can. I and I cut a couple slides out when I was back at my office, so okay. All right, so good morning. of what we went over at the principals meeting last week to update them. Um, this is of the third calculation. We were up 189 FTE and 241.87 weighted FTE. We did have an increase of um, almost 1.3 million in our FEFP revenue. But on the third calculation, the McKay Scholarship had 75 FTE and the Family Empowerment Scholarship was 119 0.34. That's a new one this year. This equates to over a million dollars, okay, that they will withhold these payments are made directly to the alternative schools. So essentially we went up about 272000 All right. So here's an S, a forecast as of right now where we're looking for the end of um, the year. The yellow column is our, our forecast. And we are looking at eating about two million of the fund balance. If you look at the net change, um, this still will keep us a little over four point five nine percent of our fund balance, um, which we're probably going to use next year. So, um, all right. Just to remind you, our school board policy is um, three point five percent. So. We would be in line, but after next year's budgeting, we'll have to see where we end up. All right, so these slides are just um, the actual FEFP that came down from the House and the Senate and the differences, and I tried to color code them so you could see the difference between the third calc and the House's and the Senate's proposal. Um, and I'm going to summarize those in a couple slides. So this is just the, the actual numbers. And here's all our categoricals. So bottom line, if you look at the total funding, they're only off $7,000 from each other, which is kind of incredible. I was looking at a presentation from two years ago, and they were like millions and millions off from each other and what they were going to give us. So we pretty much know what we're going to get. It's just how are we going to have to spend that money? All right, our, our projections... But that does not include FRS. 
That does not include FRS, no. That's so, I mean, it, it is a little bit misleading. misleading yes. because of that. Yes. Now, I do want to make you aware that when they did the House and Senate proposals, they did use what they call Model 4 for our FTE projections. We petitioned to use Model 9 because they were not showing enough of an increase in our the committee that met in our opinion. So what we projected, and this is what will come in the final conference report when we get the final conference report, no matter what those numbers come down, um, a little bit higher, um, we're at 15. 1,419.86 on the um, unweighted FTE, where if you look, the um, model four was 15,406. So there's a few more, and of course, depending on what weight factors they put in there, it'll be different than there. So just a few more FTE, but we just felt as a committee that they were, um, their numbers were a little more restrictive than we felt we were going to have. Okay, so what are the differences? The unweighted FTE increase of 102.65. Okay, so just by our student enrollment increasing, that FTE in, or um, FEFP increase is 716,000 of the base student allocation, if it stayed the same as it is right now, and they did not increase the base student allocation, we'd already be getting $716,000 more just because of our increased enrollment. So we want to keep that in mind when they compare the base student allocation from third calc to their budget, we also have to factor in we're increasing our enrollment. So that 50 or $40 isn't all one, the 1 1.4. Only about half of it is. They both, um, Senate and House, are decreasing our cost differential. Um, the Senate by a little bit more than our House, and that's what keeps us equal with the other districts in the, in the state um, so that every student is supposed to get the same funding. Um, the, so the base student allocation, the Senate is looking to give us $40.17, which equates to $549,062. $549, the house by $50, which is $726,023. Okay, so you add that with the 716, that's where we get our 1.4, 1.2 million increase. They are both decreasing our millage. And we always say if they leave the millage alone, we'd be just fine, but they keep decreasing it. They are increasing the property value by about 605, 606 million almost. This will increase our required local effort by $214,000 and the discretionary .748 by $435,000. Sparsity supplement, the Senate's more, the House is less. The 0.748 millage, the Senate's more, the House is less. <coughs> Digital classroom, Senate giving us $55 less, the House is eliminating it. Mental health, they're both looking at giving us $133,000. Total fund compression, the House is eliminating and the Senate is increasing by 208. So basically... But it's important to see when you look at that, that you take Digital classroom and you take the total compression. Uh, I think those are the only two. So you take those. The claim is that they rolled that back into the BSA. Correct. Oh, I was going to go back to that. So when, if the BSA gets wiped out as a result of the FRS, <laughs> it's really a double hit. Correct. Because we're really losing happen. that from the our, the FRS is going. FR, to I'm sorry, from the FRS. No, but it's going to happen. And so you, You're right. so you, you lose that. And then we've also lo lost the reallocation of that categorical. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I just think for us that it's important because it's really like losing it twice. Mm -hmm. So basically the House is offering more in the BSA because they're taking mm -hmm. away some of our categoricals. Hence, the bottom line ending up almost about the same place. It's just where they're going to make us spend the money. All right, so the biggest thing is the teacher salary allocation. The Senate is um, giving us, I broke it out, um, 
almost 2.5, 80% needs to go to increase minimum salary. Only classroom teachers and certified pre-kindergarten teachers. The goal is 47.5, but basically they're saying, what can you reach with this? Um, I sat down with HR with Susie and Brennan, and we are approximately 526 classroom teachers would be raised to 42,940, which ranges from 1.87% increase to 10.53. But you, you've also estimated, I think, that really there's 800 and something. Well, this 860, is 60. That right. This is just what they're saying. Correct. Our this number is, is classroom teachers. So no. 300 and something teachers would not be funded in order to receive that, that increase. We had 860 are all instructional personnel. So this is that just... under that, that Right. Level. This is just classroom teachers. Okay. So I, mean, I, I mean, I think that's a really big, big yeah, difference. It is. It is. So that's just based on what the legislation is saying. This is what we are giving. So then the 20% we may increase salary for all instructional, which is all instructional A through D in that statute, this would give 629 instructional personnel pre-K teachers that are not included above, about 1.42. All these are estimates, but this is just what um, we were asked by FADS to come up with these numbers based on what the House and Senate were giving, and this is what we were able to come up with. Okay, the House is looking to give us three point, almost 3.5, so quite a bit more. Their 80% is just for classroom teachers. They say you cannot exceed $50,000. And how much can you reach by that, with that amount for what we have? So 526 classroom teachers would get raised to 43,710. This is 3.7 to 12.51. Again, this is just classroom teachers. The 20% would be for all instructional, and this is approximately 442 classroom teachers, not included above, get a salary increase at 2.97. The big caveat in the house is 187 non-classroom and pre-K adult education post-secondary teachers would get nothing. This is what they're, because they are just classroom teachers, whereas so the House is giving us more money, but they're offering it to less people. The Senate is giving us less money, but they want to cover everybody to some extent. So I just wanted to outline, because we keep talking about all the differences, we took the legislation, looked at what they are both looking at, and this is where we are at. <coughs> okay, so as we move forward, we have to look at salary steps for our support. The governor's proposal of a 47,500 base salary for us to increase those 860 teachers below, it would cost us 5.5,700. So that's where, and that's Ms. Himmel said that earlier today. A right, significant increase in the FRS of 1.25, and we also still need to somehow worry about the safety and mental health of our students upgrades with technology, our health insurance, the staffing, and district-wide enrollment for our students. And Tammy, none of your projections has this money in there, does it? One of the um, previous slides. The projection was for we were where we were going to end up at the end of this year. So no, we haven't figured right. that in right. until we move forward for next year. So, so even on the school safety, I mean, I've mentioned um, about adding uh, two more guardians. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not running any figures. This is just, for, this is, just These are just based on legislation. That's all yeah. These are just on legislation. So of the 5.5, if we were to bring everybody to the 47.5, you know, one house is giving us one amount and the Senate's giving us another. So either way, we still would have to come up with 2 to $3 million on top of what they're giving us to meet that. And then another 1.2 for the FRS. But, and let me bring that to another <coughs> piece. This does not include any teachers over the 47.5. That's what I was just Correct. saying. Correct. So even if we found, to say we get the, I figured the three point watt. Right. Man, but so we're two point and a half million dollars short right. by one of the proposals. That's without giving, what, 860, that's without giving the other 300 teachers nothing. Right. Yet. Or support staff. Or support staff. So 
These are just the basics, just to bring people up to that 47 dollars. But we did tell Tallahassee that this was an insult to our veteran teachers. And they ran with that, didn't they? They ran right out of the room. Okay. No, you're fine. <laughs> the 5.5 um, 5 or 5.6 million, yes. for some reason I thought there was a 6.5 million figure for us. Is there, is there, some people were not capturing again and I, and I was worried that, and it may have been that we were just doing preliminary figuring. That might have just been somebody's off the top of the head, but okay. now that HR and I have sat mm -hmm. down, we this came is, up. This, this is, is where, where we're at, at okay. right now. Thomas, I've always round and I said around close to six million, so I don't know. And, no, and, and it's it, there's you know I mean we've been trying to get our handle on it and it's been difficult. And that could be with benefits because this is just to increase well, that's the salary. What I was thinking so that's, was with this five point five is just I just took the salaries and increased yeah. everybody to four seven five. I didn't multiply. So you got twenty percent roughly there. But yes, it'll we'll go from probably about seventeen percent for benefits to about eighteen point five for benefits, and that's with a little decrease in workers comp to help offset the increase in FRS based on what they both put out, which they both did approve their FRS plans last week. They both voted and, you know, so now it's just a matter of haggling it out. And they will be done by the time we have our workshop next month. Right. Because it's the one thing they do have to finish. <laughs> All right, so back to the budget calendar. Um, I'm highlighting today. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to go over the capital um, in a moment. So this is where we're at. The school and um, the district administrators, the school administrators have all have seen this presentation. They're going to be receiving their budget packets at the end of this week, and they'll start working on their budgets. And um, then we'll have staffing review, and I will give you another update in March. Okay? All right, so the capital. So what I did here is just take our five-year work plan that we already have, and the highlighted number is where I've projected that our um, fund balance will be at the end of this year, okay? Which is a little higher than what our original work plan was. So this is just, I increased the taxable value based on what they gave us in the um, proposals, which was a little bit higher, so that's good for our capital fund. So basically, here we, at the end of the, the five-year plan, which is now we're almost down to four, we're looking at about having about $21.1 in our capital fund if everything just stays where it's at. So I just wanted to give you a little update that's a little better than where we were in the budget, which was under $20 million when we did the budget in September. So are there any questions? Tears. <laughs> okay. All right. So Have a good day. And the business to come before the board. Um, yes. Did we find out anything about Friday? So about the EMT program. But we don't have the dignitaries we hold oh, okay. we've had okay. coming. Um, okay. So if we're going to wear, and it probably isn't a bad idea if we want to wear the shirts. Okay. Oh, okay. Do we has I mean, they're all in session, so is that why we're not here? Well, it's, but they're really, it's more than they're in session. Conferencing all starts. So they're put, so that was the, the, the biggest factor was they're all going into conference planning on Friday with the expectations of going into conference over the next so days. Yes, we are. So we're going to wear our blue shirts that, that are blue, the Royal EMT shirts. I'm good with them. Is that, is that what you all want? Okay. And then we did invite the um, county commissioners. Yes. And, and did yes. We? yes. Some and have and some, have, some, have, some have, right. And Christopher yeah. Rivers, City Council, I'm sure. Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah. Good. Right. Very good. Yeah. I'll, I mean, pretty yeah. much, if yeah. there was a dignitary yeah. we could think of, we we tried to. And are we, are we actually doing yeah. a ribbon? No, if they're going to do an actual ribbon, I think it's more of a. Are well, they doing a ribbon cutting, Debbie? No, ma'am. They were going to show a video and, and just kind of. Celebrate. We have cake and um, and um, they're they got they were able to get the like the Ian Ian Phil Royal um, logo on a cake. And um, so we'll have a very short um, like dedication reception. 
for and that's at one o'clock right? and where will that be? will that be at the crystal river high school <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I, they were i think it's going to start in the cafeteria okay. and then they're going to give uh, some tours of the right. um facility yes yes, yes. Check in the front the back. yes yeah yes mm -hmm. and then well can i just come in the back um uh, that gate's usually closed you, I know, but, but maybe we could we could try to uh, make arrangements for that. You guys, whatever, procedure, want, to, we would whatever you want to do is fine. Yes. yes. Whatever y'all think. Y'all would be just great just to go around the back. back. Just just where they park the bridge or four yeah. on. But the only thing you can park back, I don't know how long it's going to take, but if it takes till right. whatever two, you're going to be involved with getting out of that parking lot with students. I don't think unless you plan on staying for an extended period of time, they they dismiss at what, 2.40? Yeah. So I think we should be out of there before then. Yes. One, could learn one other thing too before we got that Joe Royal then um, our workshop, you know, our next month is not gonna be on the twenty fourth, it's gonna be on the thirty first because we're gonna have a spring break on the twenty fourth. Has everybody got that on the calendar? Got it? Yes. Good. Okay. okay. And so. you've got the thirteenth on our calendars too for the Stone Douglas uh, yes. presentation. Mm -hmm. Friday 13th. And just so you'll know, I'll probably be a few minutes late because I'm speaking at the chamber that day, which they okay. scheduled two months ago. So that's usually over by one o'clock. So yeah. okay, okay. So Friday, y'all are invited to hand out medals for the kids. Yeah, okay, I don't have Stone and Douglas on the 13th. I don't. March 13th yeah. is our. It was sent out. Yeah, it was, it was sent out, and we talked about it in our meeting. That's the half day, or that's the professional development day. Right, that's uh, it. One o'clock, one to three. And where is, is that, that going to be advertised? I think it's Pearson. Is it an open meeting? Yeah. Yes. We probably should. I for, with yes. the board. There's going to be a public notice out of it's that. It's on the workshop. And it's going to be like a workshop. Okay. And I have a board. One to one three, three at Kurtz exactly. Peterson. Okay. Any other business? I have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, the 13th, isn't that the deputy season? Yes, that's right. Okay, so it's very exactly. Based on the trades. Based on the trades. And then, um, yeah, I did. I did. Since we finished all of our business through the courtesy of postponing two, and you were great, um, this meeting will stand adjourned, and we will see each other at the Board of County Commissioners. Yes. Uh, one o'clock. Yeah, Sam, don't go.